Good afternoon and welcome to the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, my name is Jamie Williamson. I'm the Executive Vice President uh, here at Scripps. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, colleagues, postdoc students here, but I'd like to have a particular welcome for members of the community to, to come here. How, how many people here, this is the first time to come to Scripps? Okay, welcome. And uh, you're, you can see we have a new logo. It's very flashy that we're very proud of. And the, the, the infinity symbol uh, is in explicitly intended to uh, evoke infinite possibilities. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's just one of the things that we're doing to try to increase awareness in the community. Uh, and one of, you're here at an event, which is the Front Row Lecture Series. So this is the second lecture series. We had one previously that was given by our president, Pete Schultz, and he outlined his vision for how do you support biomedical uh, research uh, with a new model that sustains research and uh, it, it, it's based on combining uh, biotechnology and basic research model. Uh, so that was a pretty uh, uh, thorough and uh, interesting um, uh, uh, analysis of how we're going to go forward uh, with our research program. Uh, so we, we want to have this periodic uh, lecture series, and we've got Kristen Baldwin, who is our uh, present speaker for today. So I thought I'd say a little bit about what she does. So Kristen is a member of the uh, neuroscience department here. Uh, she came here in 2006 and started her career as an assistant professor, and she basically uh, had a meteoric rise uh, to the, uh, an incredibly prominent place. Her, her program uh, combines use of stem cells and precision medicine and genome editing to try to study some of the most fundamental diseases uh, it, that uh, humanity faces. Uh, so it's, it's safe to say that we're at this unprecedented time in, in history where our ability to understand our genome at the nucleotide level. You can sequence your DNA, send it off to any of a bunch of companies. You can get your genome sequenced. Now, what do you do with that information? Our ability to get our DNA sequence has far outstripped our ability to use that information to impact our own personal health. And so this is an emerging field, which is, some people call precision medicine. I know my genome, I, I have this disease, I have this gene, I have this mutation. What can I do about it? So Kristen has been uh, at the forefront of trying to understand, uh, in, in particular, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so she's developed incredible tools. Uh, I mean, so the, the human brain is incredibly complex, and it's difficult to do experiments on your brain. You can't just take a bunch of drugs and see what happens. So it's very, very difficult to come up with disease models that allow you to make progress on a treatment such to the point where you can actually try it in people. So she's developed a lot of different tools, including, uh, you know, uh, she'll talk about, you know, disease in a dish, uh, and she's developed ways to uh, differentiate uh, uh, somatic cells into a, a, a wide variety of different neurons that allow you to understand their function and to develop drug screens that will accelerate uh, the, the pace of, of progress on diseases such as Parkinson's. And then I believe at the end, she's also been uh, re most recently working on coronary artery disease. So uh, you're in for, in for a wild ride. She's a brilliant scientist, and, uh, and I, I look forward to her lecture. Now, one last remark I wanted to make is uh, <clears throat> we have a, a, a special group that's present here, which is a network for women in science. Uh, this is <clears throat> uh, primarily a graduate student-led organization, and its, it's, uh, its intent is to uh, foster gender parity in the sciences, uh, to provide uh, resources and a supportive environment for women at Scripps to uh, 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 you know, uh, pursue, uh, pursue their research careers and to, to generally keep these very relevant issues at, at the forefront. Uh, so we're very proud to have them here, acknowledge all of the work that they do, and, and I would say <laughs> it's working. We, uh, we hired um, five assistant professors last year at Scripps, and I'm really proud that four of them were female faculty members. And I have to give uh, Inwis some credit for keeping this issue at the very forefront, so thank you. 
So I'm going to stop, and I'm going to uh, give the stage over to Kristen Baldwin, and uh, we look forward to her lecture. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jamie, um, for the introduction. He told me to introduce myself, uh, my background, so I think I will tell you that I was born in Ohio. I grew up in a small town of 3,000 people without any scientists, um, so um, it's quite remarkable to be here. I'm very grateful uh, for that. I then went to Duke for an undergraduate in economics, Stanford <clears throat> for a PhD in immunology, Columbia to work with Richard Axel in neurobiology, where I then collaborated with Rudolf Janisch in stem cells and cloning at MIT, and I ended up here. So um, <clears throat> I'm used to changing directions, and um, uh, I hope you are too, because this talk is going to be a little bit of a wild ride through the things we've done to get us to be able to hopefully um, <clears throat> solve some diseases. <clears throat> and um, it all started really with cloning. So it's going to go from cloning to neurons to coronary artery disease. Um, and there'll be a lot of movies. So um, if you get tired, just wait for the next movie. So as Jamie said, um, let's see if I can get this. I'm not hunched. Um, as Jamie said, this is a great time to be a scientist. We have the lists of genes that describe the underlying cause of the diversity among humanity and the underlying cause of many of our diseases. And we have ways of looking at those, and you see little dots, and those are changes between people that are known to be related to disease. <clears throat> um, we think we can uh, take these lists of gene changes and turn them into cures, uh, but we, as Jamie said, don't know how. So a, a long-term goal of my research has been to understand cellular changing and cellular plasticity in order to build this bridge. So. Um, that's what we do in my lab, is try to find ways to make cells in a dish that will help answer these questions. Um, when we have the right cells, we can then find the targets and mechanisms of diseases. And when we do it from humans, we also think we learn a bit just about what it is to be a human. Um, then once we understand targets and mechanisms, we can do two things. We can actually go over to our friends in the chemistry department or at Caliber and try to find screens for molecules that will change a disease state back to a non-disease state. Um, or in some cases, we can even take the cells themselves and use them or the ways to change them in vivo. And I think this is a really promising area, but it's, it's, it's much too new for me to be dipping my toes in quite yet. So um, why is this so exciting to a scientist, um, even if I didn't care about disease? What we learned in biology class, and I think is no longer taught, is that from the time you are an egg, a fertilized egg, your development is really a one-way street. And you make in cereal a highly orchestrated set of cell types um, that basically form um, a person, um, such as Alice. And, and, and the way this is, is done, I just want you to remember two things. This is the only biology diagram I'm going to put in here, is that all of your cells, we think, have the same genome. But when you're making the different cells, that genome tells, with each division, one cell to become one thing and another cell to become another thing. And when you watch the building of an organism, this order is very precise, and it happens at the same time, and you get the right numbers of cells so that you end up with the right s situation. And Really, um, for ages, it was thought that you could never um, reverse this arrow. And in fact, aging is another version of this, where, um, as you all know, we age in one direction. So the question is, can we ever reverse these arrows in a biology lab to learn about development or disease? And I'm going to tell you today that, in fact, we have learned very well to reverse this arrow of development. Um, but um, don't get excited. We have not learned to reverse the arrow of aging, but we might be able to do something about um, some of the diseases that plague you and make it a bit more comfortable. So um, it all began when I was a postdoc and I started a crazy project uh, to clone mice from their own neurons. And um, we did this for sort of esoteric reasons, but uh, what we learned from it was that you can reverse differentiation, and that had been shown by others, but we uh, showed it in this extreme case. So this is an example of how we used to reverse differentiation using cloning. What you do is you take this red cell, which is a, um, 
a neuron taken out of a mouse. And, okay, good. Um, and then um, Sergey and his team at the Mouse Genetics Corps take eggs from the mouse and they take the nucleus out of them, take its DNA out, and they replace it with this old DNA that thinks it's a neuron and has been uh, played with to make it only turn on the neuronal genes and to not turn on the other genes. And you'll see the nucleus coming in, and it goes into this sort of mysterious sack of proteins and gunk. And um, you do this about 100 times. Um, it used to be in a warm room, the ambient temperature and humidity of Hawaii, but we don't have to do that anymore. And um, when that happens, you eventually can make um, about one in 100 of these turn into a stem cell line that didn't come from an embryo. It came from a neuron and actually a live mouse. So what we learned from this long ago was that perfectly good mice can be cloned from very old neurons. Every neuron now, we just found out, has its own unique genome. So we thought all your genomes were the same, but they're actually getting messed up. And they get messed up with aging. And this decay actually, weirdly, in neurons is specific to the genes you use. So this, this finding that we published a few years ago may be relevant to the degeneration of your brain. So. Um, the egg cloning approach is, is really lovely, but it's really time consuming and um, very low probability of success. And I think many of you have you many of you have heard that there has been a huge discovery in 2006 to take a differentiated cell and reprogram it back to a stem cell line without ever using embryos. And this is an example of that happening in real time. The way you do it is you just take skin cells, you put four things in called transcription factors, you wait about two weeks. And then you get these colonies, and these colonies have all the properties of those cells I was showing you before that could make a mouse, and the properties mostly of embryonic stem cells, but again, there were no embryos. So Shinya Yamanaka, when he discovered this, actually um, showed that you could get these cells to contribute to a mouse and make sort of a clone, but you'll see these white spots that are here and not here. They could never make a mouse that was entirely, entirely composed of these cells, and that led some to question whether these could ever replace embryonic stem cells. Um, in my lab at Scripps, we thought, well, maybe we can try this anyway, even though people were saying it wouldn't work. And in fact, it did work. And with Sergey's help, we generated the first mice, along with two groups in China, that are derived entirely from a skin cell after going through a stem cell intermediate. So as Alice would say, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. So uh, he used to be a skin cell. So um, uh, for this result, they uh, tortured me and made me be in a television show where I had to explain this using only sand and a shovel. <laughs> okay? You can watch that. I'm not sure it will make any more sense than this lecture. But Shinya and John Gurdon were awarded the Nobel Prize a few years ago in 2012 for this fundamental insight that we can reverse cell development using the egg or using a much simpler method. So um, this, this just turned everything I thought about biology on its head and said, you know, now we can do things we never dreamed of. We can take from people blood or skin, and we can make copies of their cells and their organs. We can look at them in a dish and so on, maybe replace them. Um, and that's all in theory, but now um, we had to do the hard work of actually starting to make this system work. And this is not, I should mention, all of this work has been done by many, many labs, um, including mine. Um, some of the things we've done uh, were funded by CIRM to uh, help uh, use uh, genome sequencing to find the most safe uh, kinds of iPS cells. And we've also collaborated with Richard Lerner here um, to try to make these cells without putting these factors into their DNA, but to actually trick them into reprogramming from the outside. And we were able to replace two or three of these factors with antibodies, which are a much safer way to trigger cell fate. And we're working on making all antibody reprogramming in humans, which would be great if possible. The other thing that I'll briefly cover is we've worked with um, Eric Tobel. I'll get back to that at the end of the talk. Um, and um, Eric has collected a group of very interesting people called the Welderly, people who live to be greatly aged and have almost no disease. So uh, we thought it would be a good idea to capture these people's genomes forever by making stem cell lines from them, and we've done that. And then we wanted to look to see when you reprogram a very healthy 100-year-old person, um, do they look old at the stem cell level or young? And what we found is, Functionally, we can get them back basically to look almost like a cell that comes from a newborn. So that's very exciting about this idea of reversing cell identity. 
Um, but genomically, in their DNA, they actually have mutations, and you have more as you age. But what we found out, there is some good news. Um, these are cells derived from blood that become stem cells. The mutations go up and up and up until you hit 85, and then they stop. And we um, saw some evidence that that's because when you're older, your blood has stem cells that it's saved that haven't divided so much, and they actually are low mutation cells. And this may be common in nature because a similar result was found in the Napoleon tree, an ancient oak tree that was actually there when Napoleon's army went by and seems to have retained stem cells that have fewer mutations and it uses it to build its branches. So um, <clears throat> again, we're not reversing aging, but we're learning something about it from these approaches. Um, what about the other stuff? Um, my background, <laughs> Uh, somewhat, I guess, is in neurobiology and my current position is, and I, I, I think uh, the problems of the brain have been the ones most difficult to solve uh, without using human cells. And we don't have a lot of people donating half of their cortex to us. Uh, you know, it, for some of us, it might have a, pro, uh, a negative effect. So, um, but yet we have this large societal burden of unsolved diseases, diseases of development, um, diseases of middle life like schizophrenia, addiction, and then neurodegenerative diseases that can strike at young and old levels. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we had to tweak this technology a little further, I think, to let us attack these problems. And then I'll finish with a, a few things about um, getting from coronary artery disease genetics all the way to hopefully some druggable targets. So the brain is an amazing thing. It, like you, is built just from your genome, and your genome uh, makes this in extraordinary diversity of cell types by turning on and off different genes in a very orchestrated fashion. Um, we don't even know how many cell types there are, but this um, picture of Stephen Hawking represents um, the, the key thing. Studying neurologic disease, subtypes matter. Stephen Hawking has brains in his, uh, neurons in his brain that can conceive of the beginning of the universe and then write an equation that's true about it. He also has neurons, uh, motor neurons, or had motor neurons, that don't work. If you were trying to study his motor neuron wasting disease and you were looking at his cortical neurons, you would get the wrong answer and vice versa. So this is really important. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, it also says we have a lot to know about how the brain works um, and, and how to treat these kinds of diseases. So the way that we originally started trying to make neurons from humans in a dish was to take the stem cells and use a mimicry of development to coax them to make all different kinds of neurons. Um, and this works, but it takes almost as long as it does in gestation. So to get some kinds of neurons, it's nine months. Um, and so that's fine for me because I'm here and I'm not going anywhere, but the students and postdocs if they want to repeat their experiment five times, it doesn't work so well. So, um, and, and these neurons, when they come out, are quite embryonic, and they're not as useful, perhaps, for um, modeling diseases of aging, which are some of those that we're most concerned about, um, those of us aging. Um, so the um, alternative was to actually say, wait a minute, if Shinya Yamanaka could change a fibroblast, a skin cell, into a stem cell with transcription factors, maybe we can just change a skin cell right into a neuron. Now, this was really, really going against dogma because we thought there might be something special about an embryonic stem cell type thing that, that you could go back to that but nothing else. But, but uh, Marius Wernig at Stanford actually succeeded in doing this, although we were trying to do it in my lab as well. And what he found is you could take three factors and you could make some sort of excitatory like neuron um, that might look like the, the cortex. And then other groups showed that if you kept adding more and more factors, you could get some of them to look like clinically important neurons, like motor neurons that ALS would be relevant for, or dopaminergic neurons relevant for Parkinson's. And that this has two advantages. It's very fast, um, two weeks, three weeks. Um, and the neurons come out actually looking a bit older, and they may retain more of the features of age that are important to understand disease. So in my lab, we wanted to make any kind of important neuron we could. One type that we thought was really important that no one had made were the peripheral sensory neurons of your uh, nervous system that detect heat, cold, pain, itch, touch and position and which are often injured in uh, spinal cord injury and also selectively affected in a number of childhood onset neurodegenerative diseases. So how would we go about that? 
Um, what we did is we actually um, thought, you know, a lot of times less is more. Rather than adding more factors to the ones that were there, by thinking about how the biology must be working um, as deeply as we could, we thought, you know, I think if you put too much information in, you may get messed up cells. And if we can put in the most minimal information, maybe we can get pure populations of cells. And we happen to know that some of the transcription factors, these factors that made these cells, um, looked a lot like the ones Marius used, but were different family members. So what we decided to do is sort of a, a swap and a reduction, as Coco Chanel would say, uh, before you leave the house, if you want to look chic, just take one thing off. So uh, we decided to take two factors and add them to the skin cells and see if we could get neurons. And so um, now I'm going to show you a movie, I hope, that um, is, oops, I'll show you this one first. So this is an actual skin cell turning into a neuron and branching and forming this characteristic structure of a neuron, which is an axon, which is how the neuron communicates with the other neuron. Other cells don't have those. And um, let's see if this will work. Um, so this is a slower motion. Both of these are time-lapse videos that are taken every hour or so for the week or two that it takes to turn a fibroblast skin cell in gray into a neuron, and we've put a trick in to make them turn red when you make the neuron. So um, this is a um, reenactment of this experiment, I just should say, but um, it's about the same thing. And so you can see them over time changing um, and, and becoming very different. And these kinds of movies, we just were borrowing a microscope to be able to watch them, but they're really interesting. You can see the cells sort of meeting and talking and making connections. Um, and if we had one, we would be doing a lot more of this. But um, it's, it's just remarkable. Uh, one thing that this shows is that the cells actually don't even have to divide. They can actually reprogram their entire gene expression pattern, their cell shape, their whole identity, um, without even doing anything like splitting up the DNA and, and taking off its uh, marks that tell it to keep one gene off and one gene on. It just can happen just with two factors in a skin cell for two weeks. So to me, that's really tremendously surprising. Um, and you can see them getting more and more mature. So how do we know that they're neurons? We can stain them with markers of mature neurons. And if they're yellow, they're mature here. Uh, we've published this, and we did lots and lots of characterization. You can take little pictures of them. What The definitive test for a neuron is, is to do what we call electrophysiology. You poke it with um, a pipette, and then you record electrical current. And if it's a neuron, it can do things like this fire, things called spontaneous action potentials. And when you see those, you know it's a pretty good neuron. Um, we wanted to know if we could use these to actually study things like um, pain and itch. So we wanted to see, can we tell when a neuron is turning on in respect to pain or um, cool or uh, itch ligands? And I'm just showing you a few here. So uh, there's a way when a neuron turns on to make it light up, and it's in pseudo color. So when you see something get brighter, that means the neuron is paying attention to this. And if it was pain, you'd look for something that could block it. So we first test to make sure they can all do it. Then you add chili pepper and only one goes on, and then you add uh, cool mint, and only one goes on. And when we add a compound that's called like mustard oil or wasabi, we get a more broad response. And we can do the same thing with itch. So this is relevant for the next short bit, which is once you have the neurons, you can do things with them. Um, and because we can make them from so many different people's backgrounds, we can make lots of them. We can make them over and over again, and we can genetically engineer them. They're very suitable to start to go into the caliber type screening um, systems and to use also locally to test different kinds of compounds that might be of clinical use but may be relevant to people with one genetic background and not another. So that was great, but the thing is, we really rested on the shoulders of people who had done 30, 40 years of research to find those two transcription factors were important for sensory neurons. But in the brain, we have 10,000 other cell types. And when you have a different disease um, that's less understood, like schizophrenia or uh, autism or depression, um, addiction, anxiety, all of these things, um, we don't really know which neurons they affect or how that happens. 
Um, but we are starting to know which genes they use. And so what we wanted to do is have a way of getting the neurons that we didn't know that much about. And one way would be to have two students and postdocs for every neural subtype work for 30 years to find out how to do that. And um, while we have the funding for that, I had no volunteers. Um, so <laughs> so um, we thought maybe we can make this less guesswork and learn something about it, um, maybe find a code for reprogramming of neurons. And so um, what we wanted to do is, is be a little like, less like alchemists and a little more like our synthetic chemists that we have here. So how would we do this? So uh, Rachel Sunamoto in the lab uh, paired up um, with some other people and they cloned, that means they got um, a bunch of these transcription factors that had ever been reported used in the brain and they made them into 600 things to test and then they tested them in triplicate and um, I told them that I was certain that they would find um, a bunch of new things. And then Rachel came to my office with the result and I thought, I hope she got something, because I, you know, I could have been wrong. But luckily, she did the experiment very well, and we actually remarkably found at least 76 new ways. So we really worked hard for that one new way, and then in about the same amount of time, we found 76 uh, to make these kinds of neurons. So we recently published this in Nature, um, and this work got supported by the NIH Pioneers Award. It's very exciting. Um, we can now do this in human. We can do this in mouse. Most exciting, actually, was that when we started to record from these, we could see signals that actually told us the neurons were actually talking to each other. Um, and they were doing this on their own outside of the brain, having been um, uh, skin cells two or three weeks ago. So that, that to me, is really advanced reprogramming. I mean, that's, that's as much as you want your neurons to do. So um, the next thing that we did in this was to build a database so that if you ever want a neuron that expresses a particular gene, you can type in that gene, and then I'll tell you which codes will give you that gene and what neuron. Um, we're trying to link the codes to actual neuronal subtypes, but that turns out to be quite difficult since there's no definition for these subtypes. Um, but uh, that actually doesn't really matter for many diseases. So for example, for autism, we now have lists of hundreds of genes that cause autism in, in um, uh, babies that are new mutations their parents didn't have. And I'm collaborating with the Simons Foundation and Mike Wiggler, who's collected a thousand families, parents, affected, unaffected siblings, sequence their whole genome, and we're going to take those cells and try to use them to make the very cells affected by those genes uh, in a dish and find out what's wrong with them. So that's a really exciting example of what we're trying to do, and we're also trying to work on Alzheimer's um, and potentially schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, so the advantages are we can get these cells reproducibly and quickly. Um, we think we can learn more and more from this kind of, of system and um, uh, try to find some design principles for getting the cells we need. And knowing how to build them, of course, will tell us something about what breaks them down as well. So this is something that's a lifelong dream of mine and I think um, very exciting to be able to be part of that. So hopefully we've opened a door and taken a step closer to addressing these uh, many diseases. And I should also mention many of my colleagues here at Scripps I've been collaborating with on who have expertise in Friedrich's ataxia and Charcot-Marie-Tooth syndrome at UCSD, Sandra Encolata with another neurodegenerative disease um, for which um, Jeff Kelly has a even a drug on the market. So we're um, collaborating all over the place to try to use these um, uh, as best we can. Um, so the last part of my talk is, you know, the Alice in Wonderland theme. Um, I knew nothing, nothing at all about uh, cardiovascular disease. I, I knew about economics, I knew about immunology, I knew about neurobiology, I knew about stem cell biology, so why not study the um, heart? Um, next. So, um, <laughs> so we did. But um, what, what, um, uh, what I want to tell you is that despite diseases of the brain being really hard to treat, the number one killer worldwide is really um, coronary artery disease, when your arteries clog. And we know a lot about the causes of that that have to do with cholesterol. And recently, we've started to collect lists of genes that are linked to that disease. And in fact, 
um, in 2007, the first strongest risk locus for this disease was found. Um, and this locus is really quite interesting. It actually is super prevalent um, in non-African populations. A quarter of us have two copies of it, and that doubles your risk for this disease. Uh, half of us have one copy, and then you have an intermediate risk. It costs the U.S. 30 to $50 billion a year estimated because it accounts for something like 10 to 15 percent of the actual incidence of disease. That's just one piece of your genome. So if you think the genome is not important, I would, I would say this piece sure is. Um, so how does it work? Well, the genetic studies have told us actually that it doesn't have to do with lifestyle, um, cholesterol, um, or um, uh, an active, uh, <laughs> active lifestyle. In fact, we can show that, um, I'm sorry, uh, has been shown that uh, Otzi, the ice man who was dead many thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, actually had coronary artery disease and also had this risk locus. And we assume that he was living a rather active lifestyle. So um, uh, you can actually also, I learned in Italy they have an institute for mummies and the Iceman that I never knew about, um, which seems interesting. Okay, so, um, uh, so the human genetics really strongly implicates a different mechanism than the one that our current drugs target, which is a problem in the vascular wall. And the vascular wall has a uh, muscle layer and it has an endothelial layer. So the, these are called vascular smooth muscle cells. And, and, and when you have um, atherosclerosis, uh, these muscle cells are among the first to dedifferentiate and form uh, cells called synthetic cells that comprise this plaque. And they've also been shown now to make these foam cells that also make plaques. So um, this process of going from a, a good muscle cell to a less good muscle cell seems to be key, perhaps, in the initiation of the disease. And that also seems to be linked to 9P21, this locus. So what we wanted to do in collaboration with Eric Topol was to demystify what I'm calling the most expensive piece of genomic real estate. Okay, and this in New York is the most expensive piece of real estate, and it's a residential tower, and nobody knows who lives there because it's all LLCs of people from other countries. So it's quite mysterious. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, uh, this, this region is really mysterious too. Um, because this region is only found in humans, and actually the risk region is really new, only in non-African humans. And um, you, to get these coronary muscles, I mean these vascular muscle cells from the coronary artery is really difficult. The only way you can really get them is if someone has a heart transplant. So you can't look at them in the person's tissue. Um, and uh, what we usually do when we find a part of the genome that's a problem is we look in and we say, oh, is there a gene there? And if there is, we study that. But there's no actual coding genes in this region at all. So we didn't really have any way to think about how to do this. Um, there is a kind of gene called a non-coding RNA, and that part of it is in there. Um, and so that might be one candidate, but there are also regions involved that might have nothing to do with that. So how do we solve this problem? So what we decided to do um, is just remove it. So the analogy is um, if you wanted to know who lived in this building, you could just knock it down and see who came running out. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't do, yeah. So, um, but, but instead what we wanted to do is just knock out this genome region, and um, there we did. But that actually, at the time we started this, this is before these CRISPRs you may have heard of, um, we had to collaborate with Sangamo, who was using zinc finger technology and then talons, we actually knocked ours out with talons. Four people in my lab have worked really hard on this. We worked closely with Eric uh, and Ali Torkmani with the um, collecting of the patients and then doing the genomics. And Adam Engler at UCSD helped us with bioengineering tests uh, for what was going on. So um, the strategy is this. We take elderly people who don't have the disease and um, don't have the risk locus, and we take gene heart people who are from a study of people who do have coronary artery disease and do have the locus, and then we would get rid of it in both of them, and then we would make these vascular smooth muscle cells, then we would look at what genes were messed up, and then what they told us they did, we would then look at those functions and see if they were messed up. And so our predicted uh, outcome was the Clint Eastwood hypothesis, good, bad, and ugly. And so uh, what we thought is these guys would have really good cells, these guys would have sort of intermediate cells because we have the risk, you're walking around with perfectly fine vasculature for most of your life, 
and that when we got rid of this, everything would go to pot and the cells would be sick. But to make a long story short, what we found was very different from that. What we found is actually the risk cells were really different from the non-risk cells, but when you knocked out that region, just got rid of it out of the genome, vaporized it, these guys went over and were restored to the same properties, to have the same properties as the good cells. So this region um, is very bad to have, but if you have the good version, which is only different in 100 base pairs, 100 letters in over 60,000, so tiny little differences, you wouldn't even, you know, typos, um, uh, it's perfectly fine. It doesn't do anything. So this was rather um, a very exciting result in human genetics. Um, and we were also able to show that some of the genes that were wrong could be used to convert these back to bad. And what that means is that those are targets for therapeutic intervention, potentially. We have more experiments to do, but it, it's an exciting result. So what we found here is this risk region may act as a toggle switch to switch cells between a good and a bad fate. And how do we translate those 30,000 genes into uh, progress towards a therapeutic? Um, one thing we did is we looked at all the other genetic studies of coronary artery disease, and people have found about 100 genes independently, just asking people, do you have the disease or not, and saying, is that gene variant more prevalent in the people with the disease? So it could be from cholesterol, it could be from uh, a genetic predisposition to sit around, um, which I have, and the, um, uh, uh, so we wouldn't really expect these to intersect necessarily with, with this locus, but what we, what we found is that actually 38 of these are actually regulated, appear to be regulated by the risk locus. And so this forms a network of genetic risk variants that may help inform people who are going to the clinic to know how bad is my risk. We don't know yet, but if these act together, you're going to know if you have them that this would be worse than if you had this plus something over here. Um, and uh, they help us actually think about how to find potential targets to address this disease if it is indeed caused by changes in the vascular muscle cells in the vascular wall. Um, I don't know why that did that. So we're back at the bridge. Uh, the science part is over. Um, I hope I've convinced you that by starting with cloning um, and kind of um, having a a tour through the looking glass and reversing cellular development that we've learned something about um, getting across this bridge between the genetics and, um, and discoveries we need for disease. Um, and uh, I'll quote Alice one more time, go on till you come to the end, then stop. So I'm gonna stop very soon. Um, but I, I put the Alice in Wonderland in here to say, you know, we advertise our research as translational and we're quite excited by um, the prospect of doing something for human health, but m most of the great discoveries really come from basic curiosity, wandering around in a wonderland and uh, through the looking glass and saying this is very strange. And so, so many of the technologies and ways of thinking that led to this uh, hopefully step forward for human health um, really didn't come from that desire at all. It came from a curiosity, a wandering, um, a being confused, um, so remember that, support basic research. Um, and that's one of the things also I like about Scripps is we have a really strong basic research institute with top people in every field, chemistry, biology. Um, we're small so we can talk to each other more frequently, um, yet we have the ability to hold hands with the geneticists and walk over and talk to somebody who might know how to translate a discovery. So that's a really special place and I'm very grateful to Pete for uh, hiring me and supporting me um, for these last few years. Uh, finally, uh, we started with the humans of New York. Um, these are the humans of the Baldwin Lab. Raise your hand out there. They will be sitting, they're all, most of them together. Uh, they'll be sitting outside of the table if you wanna talk to them. That's, uh, those are the people who do all the work. Um, and um, you know, I've just had a great team of people over the years who have been able to withstand many hours of work and many stressful events that are required when you're trying to publish your paper in these journals. So finally, um, a list of the people, and I've had incredible support from the NIH, from CIRM, from um, a huge number of local donors and foundations that we have helped us propel our research when it was so cutting edge you couldn't get an NIH grant uh, to get the preliminary data so we could go forward and be as well-funded as we, we have been recently. 
um, knock on wood. And so um, also uh, Sergei and the Mouse Genetics Corps have been invaluable at so many levels of our research with the IPS mice and the cloning. Um, and Angela is my new administrative assistant who just got married last week and there's a beautiful picture of her. So I want to thank everyone. Um, and we will have a question and answer. And then um, don't make it too long because there's food and drink outside. I scared them. We, we can do it at the table. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, I mean, it's actually remarkable. That's about it. Now you put, um, you put them in. And um, we induce them at a certain time, and we turn them off at a certain time. Um, and then we change the media for the, the cells are sitting in from one that the original cell type likes to one that the uh, expected cell type or desired cell type likes. And, and that's basically it. Um, not all of the cells change, but what seems to be happening in the genome is that where I think what, what really is happening is we're blasting these cells with this new information, and it's like rebooting a computer. So we used to think a cell became who it was by going to the right nursery school and the right boarding school and getting into the right college, and you had to do all those things. And now we know you can just actually blast it. I think the cell gets confused, and it has to select a new pattern of gene expression, and instead of selecting it from all of the random patterns, it picks one evolution already designed and it becomes a cell type. And so if you have a couple of factors in there, they, you know, if I have a roulette model, they push the roulette ball into red at least or into some, uh, 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 something like that. So, you know, experimentally it's easy. Theoretically, we don't really understand how it works. Um, but um, uh, it's incredibly robust. Are these like proteins or genetic fragments? You put a gene and it makes the protein and it's in a virus. Um, but you can do it with antibodies, you can do it, I mean, there's lots of ways to do it. The key is getting a lot of that, those factors in for a, a pulsed period of time. Over here. Yes. Yeah, so um, with the, in the iPS cells, when you reprogram the mitochondria change and they become immature looking. Um, and in the neurons, when you reprogram them right from the skin, we don't know. I would guess they don't change right away. I haven't looked. Um, with um, cloning, you get new mitochondria. So those kinds of things would not be useful. But I think these are more useful. And Sandra, you know, and I have been trying to uh, build some models for diseases that affect mitochondria. Also, Joe Gottesfeld here works on Friedrich's ataxia, and we've, the, the first cells I showed you are affected in them, and we've worked with him to try to see if you make them from a person with ataxia, are the mitochondria affected? Um, can we make models where they are? And he already has some drugs that are in clinical trials, and we could test them and try to improve them if that worked. So it takes time, but we're quite interested. Well, the, you know, um, it, there's a lot of definition in there, right? So how do we, what, what you know, um, I'll take my genetic weirdness. <laughs> so, 
I don't want to know what it is. I haven't sequenced myself. Um, uh, but yeah, I think I think it is a time, not yet. I mean, we should think about it now, but there's just so much more information to collect and genome editing in humans in development is something that I would not do at, unless you had a fatal condition, so. We, ha we have certain projects in which that's essential, and those tend to be the projects that are collaborative and um, uh, through different labs and funded with very large amounts of money. And those are the projects that you kind of know. You can, if you can predict that, then that actually is worth putting a lot of money into and doing, right? Now, of course, something always goes wrong, um, but you can, you can write your milestones um, and meet them. But it's also really important to have unstructured um, uh, funds to explore when all of a sudden you have a great idea because you talked to another colleague and they told you something you didn't know and you suddenly realize the problem you couldn't solve the way you thought five years ago is now tractable, right? And so what you don't want to do is have a five-year plan where if something better is invented in year two and a half that could radically change it, that you won't do it, right? You need to be flexible. You need to update your plan with technology. Um, so there's a balance there. But um, I, think, I think a lot of the projects I've been in that are large have that flexibility built in, right? You have to focus on really the end goal. Um, the other thing I would say is five years uh, is not really enough time to do much biology. You know, you think about it, uh, think of the diagram I showed you of development, right? Um, uh, when you have a baby and it becomes a five-year-old, you don't reevaluate whether, have I put too many resources into this child? Maybe I shouldn't have done that and I should rethink this decision. But you know, <laughs> you shouldn't. So, so with science research, I mean, we're doing human biology. Human biology moves a little faster than that, but it's still moving at a pace that's constrained by our, our biology. So, um, Really, things take 15, you know, 10, 15, 20 years to get from an idea to a cure is a, is a 20 year or 15 year process. And, you know, I was an immunology PhD at Stanford uh, working on autoimmunity. Well, a whole bunch of cures or really good treatments for autoimmunity came out of that basic research, but it took 15 years and a lot of people. And the same goes for cancer. Now, the T cell receptor and uh, kinds of things that I worked on are being applied and they're curing people of cancer, not everyone. Um, but, but it works, but you know, that's the time it takes from basic research uh, to clinical application, but it happens, right? So, um, thank you. <laughs>